All right, so hello and welcome back. So we're going to take a look today at the Tokyo Trials Explained by History Scope, okay? I'll leave a time card up there. Watch the Nuremberg Trials. They are very important to understand what is going to be happening at the Tokyo Trials since the Tokyo Trials happened after Nuremberg. <clears throat> so I'm hopefully going to add some information to the Tokyo Trials as a whole here, okay? Um, on top of that, I hope this video is informative. I don't know, think you'll like it, but I hope it's informative. The original video is in the description to go check it out there. I'm going to be pausing to hopefully add more context around things that happened in this. Um, lastly, don't leave stupid comments. Source things, cite things, or make intelligent comments. If you do stupid things about, I don't, if you just make stupid stuff up, I'm just deleting it. YouTube is not a freedom of speech place just so you're aware. Tokyo trials saw the end of the Japanese Empire's brutal regime. It helped lay the foundation for international criminal law and the International Court of Justice. And it was only the second time in history an international tribunal sentenced people to prison and to death. But yet, it's barely mentioned in history. Today, I seek to change that. Japan had been living in a self-imposed isolation for centuries. Until 1854, when the USA forced it to open its ports and markets. Japanese leaders, realizing just how weak they had become compared to the rest of the world, created a plan. Commodore Matthew Perry opened up Japan when he did that. Long story short, American trade imperialism. To rapidly westernize, modernize, and industrialize. As Japan's economy grew, it soon ran out of the resources to run that modern economy. As a result, Japan would fight several wars to gain access to foreign resources, and eventually taking over a large part of Asia, until its defeat at the hands of Allied powers. As the Japanese army moved across Asia, it became apparent that they were committing atrocities on a massive scale. Slave labor, comfort women, massacres. When the there was more than that, I assure you. The tide of war had turned, the leaders of various powers came together to declare that the leaders of Japan will be punished. But the details of this were left vague. When Japan surrendered, the US came to occupy the island nation. And so the question- The US had fought the majority, I mean the US was one of the basically major powers that fought against Japan in the Pacific. Britain also helped, uh, the United Kingdom, Australia, of course, helped. A lot of allied powers helped. The Philippines helped. The Dutch East Indies helped. Again, but the majority of the war fighting was done by the United States to basically destroy Japan. And so the question of how Japanese leaders would be punished fell mostly to the USA. And the USA decided to largely copy the system used to punish the German leadership after World War II, called the Nuremberg Trial. It was a military tribunal to prosecute Germany's leaders for war crimes. If you want more information, there's a link at the end of this video. I'll put a link in the description too, and a time card here so you can watch that original video there. And so the USA established the International Military Tribunal for the Far East, or simply called the Tokyo Trial. And with that came the question of who would participate in the trial. Well, it was decided that only the nine countries who signed the surrender of Japan would get to sit in judgment over Japan, as well as India and the Philippines, colonies of the UK and USA respectively, who had also been fighting in the war. And so the tribunal would have 11 judges and 11 prosecution teams from each of the 11 countries. They came from Australia, India, Canada, China, France, Netherlands, New Zealand, Philippines, Soviet Union, United Kingdom, and the United States. Put it very simply, the Soviet Union were getting a, given a seat at the table because they're a major power. They came in at the very last month of the war against Japan, um, and we had to throw them a bone. Very simply. Everyone else suffered from Japanese war crimes, um, but the Soviet Union walked in and just took Manchuria, basically. The defense, however, was compromised of one quarter US lawyers and three quarter Japanese lawyers. Next came the issue of exactly which crimes a person could be indicted for. After all, most of the atrocities weren't committed by the men on trial, 
but rather by their soldiers. And so it was determined that a person could be indicted for three types of crimes. Crimes against peace, such as planning, preparing or initiating a war. War crimes, such as violating the rules of war like executing prisoners. And crimes against humanity, such as murder, enslavement or deportation. You will see that conspiracy to commit things is not on here. At best, you could get conspiracy uh, against peace, I believe. Crimes against peace, such as planning, preparing, or initiating a war. Planning, preparing, or initiating a war are not conspiracy charges. Again, I talked about the conspiracy um, charges are very dubious legally today. Uh, United States is one of the very few countries that still does that. But war crimes and then um, war crimes, obviously. Executing prisoners and crimes against humanity. And again, crimes against humanity doesn't really need to be explained, but basically what a normal moral person wouldn't do. Such as murder, enslavement, or deportation. Someone could be tried for any or all of them. However, a person would have to at least be indicted for crimes against peace in order to be tried at the Tokyo trial. Otherwise, they would be tried at lesser courts. So we're talking about very high offenders here, very high level officials in the Japanese government. For example, Hiroshi Oshima was the ambassador to Germany. This meant that he couldn't have committed war crimes or crimes against humanity, but he did help in planning a Their names are pronounced in the English they first name first, last name last, okay? That's flipped usually in Japanese, so it's usually last name first and then first name. Okay. War. Thus he was found guilty. Oh, let's go back, let's go back. For example, Hiroshi Oshima was the ambassador to Germany. This meant that he couldn't have committed war crimes or crimes against humanity, but he did help in planning a war. Thus he was found guilty, sentenced to life imprisonment, but paroled seven years afterwards. He would die in 1975. Or take the case of Akira Muto. He helped plan several wars and commanded an army in the Philippines where his troops conducted a long list of atrocities. Thus, he was found guilty on all three types of charges and sentenced to death. Again, just because you don't do it yourself doesn't mean you didn't orchestrate the whole thing to, for people to do it. And then came the question of how long ago an atrocity could have taken place. After all, Japan had been fighting wars since the 19th century. And again, this, again, if we go with 1939, that's leaving out China, okay? That, I mean, China's war is still going on, but that leaves out the, the invasion and the Marco Polo Bridge incident, okay? That happened in around 37. And even before then, you could go for the Korean Peninsula and stuff. Um, so you have to sort out who, where you're putting the, the timeline. Not only would gathering evidence be difficult, the oldest men on trial were teenagers during the first wars. So it was decided that the leaders could only be indicted for crimes committed after 1931. And that makes relatively, relatively, sen uh, relatively sense. That makes relative sense uh, because a lot of the atrocities that we attribute to um, the Japanese happened in the 30s. And it's also when a lot of the military um, start to take over really a lot of aspects of Japanese societies after the 30s. 1931. For example, Koki Hirota served as foreign minister and prime minister before the Second World War, but he was still indicted for crimes committed before his retirement. Hence, he was still found guilty of crimes against peace and for waging war against China in the 1930s, and he was sentenced to death. In total, 28 men were indicted, 18 senior military leaders, 9 senior political leaders, and 1 scholar. But none of them were from the imperial family. The USA determined that having the emperor on the throne would make occupying and reforming Japan a lot easier. That is true. There's an entire movie on just whether he was new or did anything about it. The thing that he definitely did, that we know for a fact, is that he told the people the war was not going very well. He didn't say surrender, but again, you have to understand Japanese language and culture to understand that you don't say, in Japanese culture, you don't ever say I love you to someone, really. You say ski or I like, and then it depends on the context of the situation. Um, 
means whether I love you or I like you, okay? So what he did, at least in the legal sense in the West, was not enough. But in Japan, it was enough to theoretically surrender. Again, we're using two different standards here. But he wasn't prosecuted, as they said, because it would, well, really, it would destroy Japan. And the U.S. knew this. Um, and they needed him to rebuild. And he was willing to cooperate and help Japan rebuild. Okay, Whether he did involve in World War II, which is basically he did and he knew and he let it happen. Let's not get two ways about it. But he was instrumental in basically Japan's uh, recovery after World War II. So even though the emperor and his family were co-conspirators in almost all indictments, the USA decided against prosecuting the imperial family. And not even the defendants would put any blame on the imperial family as they didn't want to portray the emperor in a negative light. And that is a very cultural Japanese thing. Every single one of these men, I'll go show their photo ooh, if I can. Uh, every single one of the men that was put here refused to give testimony and, and on anything against the emperor. They would all rather die um, than let him be conspired in anything that they did. And they all did. Nothing. No one said anything against the emperor. Nobody even blamed him for anything or gave any evidence to the contrary that he was nothing but innocent. USA decided against prosecuting the imperial family. And not even the defendants would put any blame on the imperial family as they didn't want to portray the emperor in a negative light. If they did comment on the emperor, then there would only be two outcomes. Either they would admit that the emperor was involved, or they would admit that they acted without the emperor's knowledge and thus committed high treason. And so, both the prosecution and the defense avoided the issue altogether. But they weren't the only one. And that's just political nature of justice at this time and really has always has been who escaped indictment the leader of japan's human experimentation unit also wasn't put on trial this is horrific this man should have been really should have been shot for what he did in unit 731 but i'll let him explain why he wasn't they performed lethal experiments to test the limits of the human body with methods too gruesome to mention in this video. The USA wanted the research results, and so traded the results in exchange for immunity of all members of the unit. I left a link in the description with the Wikipedia article for more information. But be warned, the testimonies are quite gruesome, and other websites do have images of the victims which you probably wish you had never seen. The yep. I am just saying that I am appalled by the United States decision on um, and it is not a shining example of anything we stand for in the United States. I will take his article if it is linked in his video and I will put it down there. Please, if you are squeamish and you do not like any, that is a lot of hard stuff to go through with Unit 731. I don't recommend it. I'll just put it simply. I don't recommend you do it unless you're doing a very like a methodical um, <sighs> breakdown or you're doing your thesis on the, on the Tokyo trials. And of course, you need to look at it. It's absolutely horrific what they did. The arrest of the 28 men who were indicted didn't happen smoothly, though. Hideki Tojo attempted to commit suicide by shooting himself in the heart. He was prime minister from 1941 to 1944, presiding over most conquests of the Western colonies in Asia, as well as various massacres. He believed that the war was justified and did not want to submit himself to a foreign tribunal whom they had just fought a war against. Hideki Tojo, however, missed his heart and was resuscitated shortly afterwards. There's a scene again in the American movie <coughs> about the Tokyo trial, um, which I'll go find for you and I'll tell you about it. Okay, so the movie's called Emperor. I can't believe I forgot that. In the first basically 20 minutes, it shows him how the Americans basically had to run in there and I mean, he shot himself and the Americans have to revive and resuscitate him because, again, don't let that bastard die before we get to prosecute him and kill him. Um, yeah, he tried to kill himself and take the, that way out. So. From then on, any arrest would be accompanied by medical professionals, so no war criminal could escape justice by hiding in death. Hideki Tojo accepted full responsibility in order to protect the emperor, was found guilty, and sentenced to death. And unanimously, every single one 
people in the Tokyo trial unanimously just did the exact same thing. They refused to give any information on the emperor and any involvement. The judges had assembled. The defendants were gathered, and the lawyers were ready. The trial would take two and a half years, during which two defendants died of natural causes in 1946. They were Yasuke Matsuoka, a diplomat who was one of the architects of the Tripartite Pact, and Admiral Osami Nagano, who oversaw the entire Japanese Imperial Navy. The Navy we'll talk about, but the Tripartite Pact um, between Italy, Germany, and Japan really was just like kind of an anti-communist block, but basically we are friends and we all help each other and they don't really help each other at all. Japanese Imperial Navy. Another defendant was deemed mentally ill and unfit for trial. Shumei Okawa, a scholar who was put on trial for his influence over Japan's propaganda program. He acted oddly in court, such as wearing his pajamas or slapping a fellow defendant on the head. He was released from a mental hospital in 1948, spent his later years translating the Quran into Japanese before passing away in 1957. Whether he faked his perfectly timed mental illness remains unknown. The trial Translating the Quran into Japanese is something... It takes skill that's not... I don't know. I don't know about him, but usually, I mean, like, translating the, I mean, Japan basically has, like, almost zero religions that are not, like, Jap like Bushido, uh, or Shintoism and Buddhism, are the two major ones, and everything else basically is in the less than 1%, so. The trial started with the prosecution presenting its case, spending over six months to present all the evidence against the defendants. Their job wasn't easy. As soon as the war ended, Japan's government ordered all troops to destroy any evidence of atrocities. And they were pretty damn good at doing this. They burned everything they could possibly get their hands on. It's, a, it's an example of, while we don't know a lot about Japan's experimental weapons that they had, they threw them all in lakes, they burned all the documents they had of them, they completely destroyed them from memory. Uh, they did the same thing with every war crime they committed. As a result, the prosecution couldn't rely on direct orders of atrocities. So instead, they built their case around the idea that the atrocities were consistent, widespread, and strikingly similar. By proving this, the prosecution wanted to show that such acts could have only been committed if the Japanese government had ordered these massacres. And that makes sense. Again, if they're consistent enough, if they all end in the same way with everything that's similar, it's only possible that it came from the higher ups, which is what you're going to have to prove when all the documentation has basically been destroyed and you can't use witnesses because again, witnesses can be unreliable testimony. ...been committed if the Japanese government had ordered these massacres. After all, if atrocities were common and similar, then there would need to be some sort of central authority directing these similar acts. But even if that were true, that still wouldn't prove that these men on trial were personally responsible. Theoretically, it was possible that only a few of them directed atrocities while the rest were innocent. Or at least uh, didn't do anything about it, more or less. So the prosecution tried to prove three things for each of the defendant. One, that the defendants were aware of the atrocities. Two, that the defendants had the power to stop these atrocities. And third, that the defendants did nothing to prevent these atrocities. And the and this is going to become a contentious issue because they pr mostly all knew it. Whether they could do anything to stop it is an entirely another matter. Um, and they did nothing about it. Is it also, they basically didn't. And third, that the defendants did nothing to prevent these atrocities. And of course... It's, it's kind of like the position of this second issue is... Um, like you know about it, um, and you did nothing about it. But the second issue is, did you try to do anything? For example, Erwin Rommel and the Nuremberg, uh, so, sorry, Erwin Rommel burned the orders to kill commandos. That is him using his authority to, um, disobey an order that is immoral. Um, whereas, um, if they didn't do anything and they just let it happen, you are responsible because you're again, the highest person and could have done something to prevent it. There was almost no evidence that these men ordered any atrocities. But the prosecution was able to prove to the court 
that almost all defendants did nothing to prevent the atrocities while having the power to do so. That's important too. They knew about it, they could have done something about it, but they have done nothing about it. The could have done something about it is very Japanese culture, okay? Wow, we're getting into this. So, again, stepping outside of the norm. You're not supposed to do that in Japanese society. It's why everyone waits at a stop sign, even if there's no cars or no... They stop at the light if there's no cars, right? They'll still wait until the thing tells them to go, just as an example. But again, when you take that example and then you keep building upon it in Japanese society, again, the collective over the individual. So if an individual wanted to stop it, it wouldn't have been the same for the collective while having the power to do so. Which leads to, again, they could have had the power to do so, but didn't stop it. Put it that way. Meaning that they were negligent in their duties to uphold the rules of war as laid out in various treaties before the Second World War. That they did in fact sign. The defense lawyers, however, fought animately for their clients. With one lawyer being quoted as saying, I intend to hang 27 of the accused to save my client. They argued that the court wasn't impartial enough, with the Philippine judge being a victim of Japanese brutality who couldn't be impartial in his verdict, according to the defense. Which is a very solid defense. Um, I mean, if, <laughs> that's, if the, the judge that is judging you suffered from war crimes that you are being charged with and might have done, that might skew their, well, I don't know, ruling or judgment on you. Their request to replace the judge, however, was denied. The Tokyo trial is, I won't say it is a complete show trial, because it wasn't. They tried to get as much evidence as possible, but again, you're going to start seeing the little pinpricks that the defense is like, because this is a very valid defense, that you, the war, war crimes, he suffered war crimes from things that you might have done, um, and how can he possibly be impartial? Again, he lost family members, um... And he suffered directly because of war crimes. So how could you possibly be impartial in your rulings? But again, it was ignored by the... Uh, the defense was ignored. Denied. But they went further, arguing that the trial as a whole did not hold any legitimacy, stating that even if the defendants were negligent in their duty, that they couldn't legally be held accountable. They pointed out that many of the countries on the tribunal, such as France the Netherlands, the UK, and the USA were only on the tribunal because they colonized Asia, and they colonized Asia through aggressive wars of their own. They have a valid point. This is 100% valid. All the colonies that they... Basically, we were mad that they took our colonies and did horrific things to the people while everyone, like all of the Western nations, were doing horrific things to the people there. A perfect example is the Dutch East Indies. The Dutch, after World War II, had to go fight an insurgency in the Dutch East Indies and committed war crimes there. So it's... The defense therefore argued that Japan's wars were no different than Western wars. So why should Japan be held to a different level of accountability than the rest of the world? I won't say they were, they were the exact same similar, but if you go back to the 1800s, it gets pretty muddy real quick. The defense also attacked the notion that Japan was fighting wars of aggression. Instead. They explained that for centuries, Europe and the USA had invaded Asia, attacking Japan's neighbors one by one, and that Japan was being threatened by Western imperialism. That defense is a little weak, though, because, again, they didn't have to attack these countries. But basically all it is is this is my land, you attacked me, X, Y, and Z. Um, as you can see, look. Look, I mean, just look, you don't have to just take my word. Don't, have, don't take my word for it. Just look at the map. Look at how many countries here own countries that are now free and independent countries today, um, but were colonies of the West at the time. Attacking Japan's neighbors one by one, and that Japan was being threatened by Western imperialism. They explained that Japan was an isolationist country for 220 years until those powers forced Japan to open its markets to foreign trade. And when Japan was forced to modernize and industrialize to keep up with the invading Western powers, Japan had to invade its neighbors for the resources it needed for its survival. Just as Western powers had done, 
They argued that the USA cut off oil supplies to Japan as long as Japan was occupying the mainland of Asia. With only two years of oil supplies left, Japan was facing extinction. And so Japan was left with only two choices. Either Japan wasn't going to go to war, in which case Japan would certainly perish. Or they would go to war, in which case Japan might perish. It was either dishonor or fight an honorable war. Um, this is, a, I mean, this is a defense of the wars of aggression, but it is not a defense against any of the war crimes. But again, as stated, they have to have, they had to be convicted of crimes against peace first before they can be convicted of, you know, war crimes and crimes against humanity. Or they would go to war in which case Japan might perish. If they perished without war, then Japanese culture would perish as other powers would dominate the island nation. But if they perished in war, then its people would rebuild their nation to once more rise to prominence another time. With the USA forcing Japan into these two options, Japan chose to go down fighting. And so, the defense argued, the blame of the war did not fall upon Japan, but rather, the blame of Japan's war against Western nations was the fault of the USA forcing Japan to go to war. No, no, no. I mean, it's a defense, it's not a very good one. When you say, hey, we'll stop giving you oil, so stop killing all the people in China, and they're like, no. Therefore, it should not be Japan, but the USA who should be put on trial. There were various versions of this argument made by various defense attorneys, but all of them would follow a similar line of reasoning. But when it came to the atrocities committed during the war, the stories of the men were very different. Some claimed to not have known about them, others claimed that they were justified. For example, Iwane Matsui was commander of the Shanghai Expeditionary Force during the Nanjing Massacre. Let's just say one of the worst war crimes ever committed in our entire history as a human species. He defended himself with, It is just the same in a family when an elder brother has taken all he can stand from his ill-behaved younger brother and has to chastise him in order to make him behave properly. He was found guilty of crimes against humanity and sentenced to death. And I feel no remorse for this man or anything. He, yeah while others testified that they did indeed try to stop massacres and therefore weren't guilty. For example, Mamoru Shimegitsu actively tried to prevent war with the Western powers, but the prosecution argued that he didn't do enough. Mm -hmm. This is one of the aspects of Tokyo Trial that is a little difficult. He tried to, but they argued, you didn't do enough. That he could have stepped down, relinquished power, and choose not to remain part of the system. That is true, though. If he stepped down, he would have stood by his morals and said, I might have, I was trying to do it from my position of power, but in the end, I chose power over uh, my legacy. And the court agreed and sentenced him to seven years in prison. So. He would be paroled after only two years, got back into politics, and served as foreign minister and deputy prime minister before passing away in 1957. Which kind of makes you question, we, again, the powers that be said, no, you didn't do enough, and you didn't step down. Sentenced for seven years, got paroled in two, and then became foreign minister and justice minister. It's a little bit. After 225 days of the defense presenting their argument, it was time for the judges to determine the innocence or guilt of the 25 remaining defendants. And again, not a trial by jury, not a trial by your peers. It's just straight judges. If over... Which is, I think, the European method. I could be wrong. Could have also be the Japanese method. The USA is very weird. We're, we're one of the few countries that does by peers. Half the judges voted a person was guilty, then they would be sentenced. Out of the 55 different charges... So they said half have to, because it was contentious. Five remaining defendants. If over half the judges voted a person was guilty, then they would be sentenced. Out of the 55 different charges which could be brought against any of the defendants, the court ruled that 45 of them were either redundant or not authorized by the court. 
and most of the defendants would be acquitted on several charges brought against them. A total of seven defendants were sentenced to death. Among those not already mentioned were Kenji Dohaira, chief of the intelligence services in Manchuria and instrumental for planning its invasion and occupation. He turned Manchuria into a vast criminal enterprise where assault, sadism, and a long list of other crimes became commonplace. I will not talk about those crimes, but they are, they are horrific. Seishiro Itagaki, an important figure in the occupation of Manchuria. Haitaro Kimura, commander of the Burma Area Army, who played an important role in the invasions of China and Southeast Asia. Eighteen defendants were sentenced to prison. Among those not already mentioned were Sadao Araki, served in various wars before the Second World War, sentenced to life imprisonment, but was released after seven years due to ill health and passed away in 1966. Kingoro Hashimoto, major instigator of the Second Sino-Japanese War, sentenced to life imprisonment, released seven years later, and died in 1957. I think we're going to see a theme here of life in prison and get out in seven years or due to ill health. Shunroku Hata, commander-in-chief of the China Expeditionary Force, which committed wide-scale atrocities under his command, sentenced to life imprisonment, paroled after six, and died in 1962. Kiichiro Hiranuma, served as prime minister and chief of the Supreme Court of Japan, sentenced to life in prison, paroled after four years, and died shortly after his release. Yeah, I think we're seeing a theme here. Naoki Hoshino. As chief secretary of the government, he was highly involved in Japanese war preparations. He was sentenced to life imprisonment, but paroled ten years later. He would go on to serve as president and chairperson of several companies, before passing away in 1978. Okinori Kaya, finance minister. He prepared Japan's financial, economic, and industrial policies for war sentenced to 20 years in prison and paroled after seven. He rejoined politics and became Minister of Justice after being convicted of war crimes. So, when you say, ah, yes, wonder why China doesn't like Japan anymore, or, you know, they haven't apologized for, oh, I don't know, what they did in Nan Nanking, Nanjing, and then this happens where you're, oh yeah, you've been sentenced of a war, you were convicted of a war crime. You have now become justice minister in Japan. So. He died in 1977. At the very least, you shouldn't hold government office again, but uh, that's not if somebody asked my opinion, but okay. Koichi Kido, one of the closest advisors to the emperor, sentenced to life imprisonment, released due to ill health five years later, and passed away in 1977. Since it's in 48, so five years, so 53, and dies in 77 from a life imprisonment charge. Okay. 24 years later. Kuniaki Koisho, governor of Korea, sentenced to life in prison, where he died two years later. Jiro Minami, minister of war. He was sentenced to life imprisonment, paroled six years later, and died in 1955. Takazumi Oka, minister of the navy given a life sentence but was paroled after six years in prison and passed away in 1954. Kenryo Sato, chief of the Military Affairs Bureau, sentenced to life imprisonment until his parole eight years later. He passed away in 1975. Shigetaro Shimada, Minister of the Navy, sentenced to life imprisonment, paroled after serving seven years, and died in 1976. This, this life imprisonment thing is kind of a joke. Like, like in the United States, you get life in prison, it means life in prison. Usually your parole is like, oh, I don't know, 20, 40 years. If that, if you actually ever get parole. Um, in Japan, apparently, it's, uh, well, you get parole after like a few years for life in prison. Toshio Shiratori, ambassador to Italy, found guilty of conspiring to wage war and sentenced to life imprisonment. He died in prison a year later in 1949. Yoshijiro Umesu, chief of the army general staff, sentenced to life imprisonment. He also died in prison a year later in 1949. Shigenori Togo, minister of foreign affairs, staunchly against the war with western powers, he repeatedly advocated for both peace before and during the war, 
While he informed his superiors of the war crimes he was aware of, the court concluded that he didn't do enough, sentenced to 20 years in prison, and passed away two years later in 1950. You can make a case on that, but again, I don't think he stepped down. So that was the, again, they want the Western powers at this at this tribunal wanted you to do everything you could to stop to have peace and then step down from the power if you knew you you couldn't do anything. But. In 1950, Teichi Suzuki, primary planner of Japan's wartime economy, sentenced to life imprisonment but paroled after serving seven years. He briefly rejoined government service and passed away at the age of 100 in 1989. With him died the last of the Tokyo trial defendants. The seven men sentenced to death would receive their punishment about six weeks later, on December 23, 1948. The seven men were executed by hanging, each dying instantly. No photographs were taken of these men after their executions, with the leader of the occupation force fearing it would embarrass or antagonize the Japanese people. Instead, which was MacArthur at the time, four members of the Allied Council would act as official witnesses. Their bodies were cremated, and so ended the Japanese imperial regime. If you like this video, I also made one on the Nuremberg trial, which you can click on here. And if you want to see more videos like and if you want to see more videos like this, like the video, subscribe, and press the notification bell. I'll link the, his original video in the description um, for this. And again, you can check out my whatever you want to call it on Nuremberg that I also did for him um, up here. If you would like to go watch that, which you should have done in the beginning of this, so you understand the full context. So. Hopefully this video was informative. I don't expect it would be fun, but it is important that we remember the history that got us to the point that we are at. And we can't forget about these um, atrocities that have happened in the past because we try to better ourselves as, as humanity. So with that, I will leave you there. So I will hopefully see you again soon.